Alrighty, and uh, next in our political segment, I'd like to bring up Mr. Murray Jones. What a round of applause for Murray Jones! Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about freedom of speech today. Uh, so uh, specifically things that threaten freedom of speech. Now I know the country we're currently living in. Uh, you know, that's a topic for another day maybe. I don't know enough about it myself. So I'm going to talk about it from, I use examples from the UK, that's where I'm from. So that's, that's the perspective we're going to talk about. from. Success. That's what I know about. So, but these are the five threats, right? So we've got the kind of the obvious one, the most historical one, authoritarian regimes. Uh, and then we've got uh, the opposite, liberal democracies that are now uh, legislating for or uh, ad against free speech, as I'd argue. Then we've got what I call the bastardization of free speech. This is the misunderstanding of what freedom of speech is. Uh, we've got social media monopolies, and we've got self-censorship. So if we start with authoritarianism. Uh, so this is uh, authoritarian regimes. Uh, regimes, governments that want to stop dissent, want to stop protest. So they stop people speaking out. They stop people dissenting. They stop journalists writing stories about what they're doing. I, we all, I think we all know a bit about that, the, the kind of actions that are done in that revenue. I, uh, so I got a list of the world's uh, press index for uh, the top five press freedom rankings, right? So uh, I don't know if you can guess which is which, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the bottom five, North Korea coming in out of 180 countries that they looked at. So we've got uh, Eritrea, Turkmenistan, Syria. Uh, Syria and Eritrea both wrapped in civil wars deeply, so understandable that they're in there. Uh, but China, one of the most successful, booming economies and societies in the world, uh, is coming bottom of that list. So that's not great to see. Um, but moving on. So I just wanted to touch on that. So this uh, very pixelated, ugly pug dog is has been at the center of a freedom of speech case in the UK. So. Uh, uh, his name is Buddha, and his owner, who was like a YouTube comedian, uh, taught him to uh, respond with a doggy version of the Nazi salute <laughs> uh, in response to phrases such as Sig Hail and Gas the Jews. Uh, wow. So very I'd say distasteful, insensitive, uh, but I mean, it's a pug doing a silly thing. So uh, he was taken to court. Uh, he was charged with a crime and he had to pay an 800 pound fine for being grossly offensive, is the, is the legal term that was used in the court. And if something is defined as grossly offensive, then it's uh, in the UK, you can be taken to court and charged and he's got a criminal record now for doing that. Uh, he defended it saying it was a joke. The, you know, it was a juxtaposition, dog, a dog, a cute dog doing a horrible thing is kind of funny in some way. Uh, whether you find it funny or not, it's not really relevant to the point. I suppose, but uh, uh, let's move on. So the same law, but uh, uh, not a joke. So it's not comedy. Uh, so a 19-year-old girl, she uh, she posted a tribute to a young boy who died in a road accident uh, with some rap lyrics by this is the rapper here, Snapdog. Um, you can read them up on the screen there. Uh, not kind of an odd tribute to make. Not a tribute I would have made, but. Uh, she was also taken to court. She was ch officially charged. She committed a crime of being grossly offensive. All she did was post these lyrics on her Instagram. They're not her own words. They weren't aimed at anyone in particular. She was just repeating words uh, from an American rap artist. Uh, what the problem was with the conviction uh, was that in the court it was discussed that no matter the context and no matter who said it, uh, the words uh, that she used were too grossly offensive. They were too offensive, and no matter the context, uh, that they were, that was illegal. Uh, so this is one of the first big problems I want to talk about. Is are there certain words or certain things you can say where context and intent never matter? I would argue there are not, but that's one up for discussion later on, maybe. 
Uh, so the next one is what I call the bastardization of freedom of speech. Okay, so this is when people misunderstand what free speech is. And this is a threat to freedom of speech itself because if people don't understand what freedom of speech is, how are we supposed to protect it? So freedom of speech does not equal freedom from criticism. Okay, so <laughs> you can say things and people can be really pissed off and they can have a go back at you. Your freedom of speech isn't under attack because you got criticized and people were annoyed with what you said. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, similarly, freedom of speech doesn't equal freedom from consequences. Uh, if I said something abhorrent here at this forum and you all were hating it, you can all boo at me and you can ask me to leave. It's not my freedom of speech to say whatever I want without nothing happening to me. Um, and similarly, freedom from exclusion. So you can say some things and free friends can turn their back on you or you can be kicked out of a group that you're in, you can be kicked out of your university or even your job, right? That's other people's decision. That's not your legal freedom of speech. So I think when people misunderstand this, and sometimes, especially from the right wing, they willfully misunderstand this to promote an agenda of hate or demonizing other people, uh, they use freedom of speech as kind of their cover to justify it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So I think this is one of the scariest and Him and Google. Yeah, the most pressing issues. The mic's not working. Alright, keep going. Yeah, yeah, this is one of the most pressing issues. Uh, is right, Facebook has transformed speaking of this. How we read news, how we take in news, how we discuss news with our friends or people we've never met before, right? I think uh, Facebook has really famous hate preacher, as I describe him in, in America. He touts wild conspiracy theories, really hateful things, uh, anti-Semitic, all, kind of, all those kind of things. Uh, he was recently, uh, earlier this year, kicked off uh, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter simultaneously on the same day. Um, and people kind of cheered. I think the typical people, he's a horrible person, he shouldn't have a platform, his words getting out there are horrible. Uh, so him being stopped to do that is a good thing. And, and, and again, I, I agree with the sense that uh, it's, it's those businesses, those corporations' decision and their freedom to allow or disallow things on their website. I'm uh, not entirely sure about that. But yeah, but the, there's just this, this, this set of precedent, I think, and because people of my political persuasion in general, I think, cheered because he was he was out of the picture. It's good that he's being taken off this off this platform. Uh, but the problem is that uh, what if we're allowing if all our conversations are being had on this on these forums. Uh, we're transferring the public realm of public discussion, uh, public space, and it's going into private space, into private land, where we're not actually in control. Um, I guess in our public space, normally in my country, we have a, a government in which there's a sense of accountability and 
uh, enshrined rights that are protected, but in these corporations' private uh, private spaces that they hold and where we're having the majority of our conversations, uh, we, there is no accountability, and uh, I think that I think that is a problem. Uh, I'll speak about the UK because that's what I know. I, w I wouldn't say so. I think uh, all public spaces pretty much uh, you have your your freedom of speech, the freedom from interference from the government uh, to to discuss what, what you wish. I guess I need to say like this bar is a private space or a newspaper, for example, is private mm. Uh, I guess, I guess there is a parallel, but it's much more direct, right? Uh, the person in charge of this bar has let us have this. If they changed their mind and kicked us all out, we could speak to them and try and reason with them. Or, but when you've got a global, a global platform in control of everything, there's no accountability or direct contact. So it's a bit, bit more tricky. Oh yeah. Sorry. At what point do these mega worldwide corporations? get so big that they should either be busted in the small places or become public utilities? Mm. Uh, well, that's quite interesting. I, I was trying to think of what is a solution to this uh, this problem, right? Because, I mean, we're in the Facebook age now, right? There's It's hard to see us reversing this. Yeah. Um, so what, what? So your suggestion, public utility, government-owned forum kind of thing? No, I don't believe it. No. Public utility, it's like the last speaker of the violence, structural violence. Where does it come from? Where, which institution gives us these things? Mm. The same institution that gives us Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. Yeah. Uh, Pronounced yeah. different ways in my house. Um, so there's, there's two directions, I guess. Public utility, we kind of take the corporation away from Facebook or if we have, a, we have a public model, which sort of apes Facebook, but we have those enshrined rights in them. And it's a public space, it's legally a public space. Or we uh, take the more private option and we just change our behavior. If we see uh, freedom of discussion, uh, I mean, the majority of our discussions happening on a private forum, if we see that as a problem, then we need to stop doing that and we need to change our behavior. Uh, those are the two clear paths I see. Neither one is foolproof whatsoever. Uh, the last point is self-censorship. So I guess I see this as an accumulation of all the other threats, the other four. Uh, if we become fearful of punishment uh, from uh, speaking our mind or saying what we believe in, uh, I think the natural next step is to start censoring ourselves and uh, you, we, censor, we all censor ourselves to some extent. Uh, we all kind of moderate our behavior when you're in social scenes. Basic manners and politeness is, is a moderation in some sense. But um, if we constantly feel like we have to double think and we don't even trust our own instincts to say, speak our mind clearly because we're scared of offending people or we're scared of legal punishment, we're scared of the government coming in and arresting us, or we're scared of being kicked off Facebook, which we rely on for our social life or our work life. If, uh, if you have all those fears of punishment, then uh, people start to self-censor and not really speak their mind all the time, and they kind of sink inside themselves. And if everyone self-censors, I think we will lose something quite fundamental and crucial to our society. Um, and I don't know where the line is exactly, when is too much uh, to self-censor, but uh, I think we're not heading in the right direction, which is a problem. Thank you.